Hi everyone, and welcome to the first Manage 201. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do within the Manage team is to share our knowledge more widely because a lot of the things we do are really um, expertise or really narrow focuses which one person shares. So myself, I've been working on SAML a lot, um, but Imra has been working on smart code authentication uh, James Lopez is the expert on import export and Rubens the expert on billing and on a lot of these things we don't have much visibility into what other members of the team do and even less for people who are not not on the team so we thought we'd create these 201 sessions where we kind of go into quite a bit of depth about how we work on these these areas and also that will help other people who want to contribute or to review the things we're working on so today I'll go over quite a lot of things, but starting with um, what, it, what is SAML, why it's important, um, a description of the protocol, how to actually get started working on this, and then I'll go on to some other things like the security implications of some of these things. So what, what is SAML? It's a um, single login solution. So I'm sure you're all familiar with things like Twitter sign in or Google sign in, which we use ourselves at GitLab. And what these th these systems help us do is not have to remember lots of passwords for all these different services we use. Um, so it means you can just click, what, click one button and you're signed into the service. But th there's another side to this, which is for the company, they get a lot more control over how a user authenticates. So they might enforce that everyone uses two-factor authentication, or they might control which services you can access or even remove access when you leave the company. So you go to sign in and it no longer works and the company doesn't have to worry too much about that because they set up their system and then everything just works. So SAML stands for Security Assertion Markup Protocol. Sorry, Markup Language. It'd be SAMP otherwise. And the, the key word here is assertion. So this is a confident and forceful statement of fact or belief. So SAML lets the organization make a confident statement that this, it, this user is James, his user ID is 27418. Um, his email address is jadwasjones at gitlab.com. Um, and he's a member of the backend developers group and he's on the managed team. So we, we kind of, so that's what an assertion is. And that's kind of the, the key to understanding the, how SAML works. Getting more into the detail, it's an XML based protocol. So you see here, we've got an assertion. It's got lots of different sections. The kind of interesting ones are these attributes. So we've got a UID attribute to user one. Here we've got an attribute that maps to group one and an email attribute. Another really key thing here is the name ID because that's what we use to link a user um, so when the identity provider, which is the um, service you put your password into, um, re returns its response, it says, this is user one, or this is user um, james at example.com. And so that bit that means which user this is, that's the name ID. So to give you a kind of flavor of how the protocol works, people normally would show you this kind of diagram. So um, you've got the user, you've got the identity provider, and you've got the service provider, which is, in our case, GitLab. But that's way too complicated to follow. So instead, I'll give you a quick demo. So um, at a very high level, we have this kind of My SAML button. Um, and that's, in this case, I've called it My SAML, but that'll be the organization name. And so a user who wants to authenticate, they click that button they get redirected to the identity provider. So here I'll put in my username, user one, my password, which is user one pass. So the identity, identity provider, uh, you, you're running it locally on your machine, right? Simple SAML, is that what it looks like? Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, go into that a bit more later, but in this case, it's, it's one I'm running locally on my machine. But in other cases, it'll be Azure, Act ADFS, uh, ping identity, one login, and and behind the scenes, the company will have their own system where they've got all their users. And so um, it will 
to to the user, it's just they enter their password, but behind the scenes, it could be cool. a number yeah, of different. I'm things. just curious, it's, 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 is it in the GDK to install this? So I'll I'll, I'll go for all of that later. Okay, so thanks. Um, but yeah, feel free to jump in with questions in a while because it there's a, a lot to go through, a lot to take in. So yeah, so click sign in, and you've ended up um, on on GitLab. And I'll, I'll show you that again, and we're signed in as user one. I'll show you that again, but using a tool um, to show you what's actually going on underneath. So, so this tool is called uh, SAML Chrome Panel, um, but there's also SAML Tracer for Firefox, and I've linked to those later. So. Um, and this time, of course, we're already signed in on the identity provider. So when I click this button, I'll immediately be signed in and redirected back. But there'll be a lot going on underneath, which the user won't see. So we've got these kind of two key parts. F first, the request was made to, in this case, Simple SAML to the identity provider. And we've sent them a request saying, please tell us who this user is. Um, a bit about them and are they signed in. One of the things here is we've said the issuer, so that's who we are, so they can look up which service we are and respond appropriately. And another thing we've, we've sent in this request is where we want the user to be sent back after this is all over. Um, and, and that's because this is a browser-based protocol, so everything's happened in, in the browser in these requests. One other thing to note, is that this request actually looks like this because it's base64 encoded. Um, so that's why it's really helpful to have a tool that kind of decodes that for you on the fly and gives you this nicer thing instead. Where's the user insertion in there? Or so, or so yep, perfect question because that leads on to the next part. So the identity provider responds with its SAML response. And, and back to that, that key part, it's the security assertion markup language. Um, it replies with an assertion. Um, can't find it in, uh, so I can see the, the end of the assertion, but the, the stuff is all in here. So one of the things is the name ID. So in this case, it's a really simple thing. It said, this is user one. Um, and it's also replied with some other stuff that I screenshotted before. So it's replied with, with the user and with the group. One other thing um, that is important for security is that this is a signed response. So it's replied with um, a signature value and also a copy of its certificate so we can check that it's signed correctly. Um, just to go over some of those concepts again, so you've got the identity provider, so that's where you sign in, that's often called the IDP, so if you see that it just means the identity provider. The service provider is us at GitLab um, or any other service like Office that you might be signing into. Um, you've got the request, the response, the name ID, the issuer, the attributes of the response, cool. And I just put some of these in here, but um, in case anyone wasn't watching the demo. The next thing is how we link accounts. Um, so when a user's signed in and they click that button, we link their account using that name ID. So we say the user currently signed in is the same person as name ID one, and we remember that link for future sign-ins. Um, with instant SAML, um, users can also automatically be created. So if user two signs in, we can create a, a, an account on GitLab for them. And things are a bit more complicated on gitlab.com. And so I'll describe that. And any questions so far? Cool. So on gitlab.com, we've got another problem, which is that instead of configuring these at your SAML provider in the config, there's one, there's a SAML provider for every organization. So every single um, company that wants to sign up and use this needs to configure their own identity provider. So instead of having this kind of button on the, the left, which says my SAML, when you click it, when you go to user sign in, 
you have a page for each group. And so you get something like this on the right saying sign in to my org. And so th the configuration page uh, currently looks something like this. And so they, um, so instead of having it in config, it's configured per group. And that's an important difference because we then need to look up which group someone's signing in for and then respond appropriately. Um, so just to go over that again, so Instant SAML, we've had that for a long time. It's in CE um, and thanks to CERN for, for uh, doing the initial implementation. But this group SAML for GitLab.com is something we've been working on this year. And it's, it's very different. Um, one of the things is the trust model because that, I, that identity provider that someone configures could actually be a malicious one, or one we don't trust. So I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, and that, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna have a sip of water. Anyone thinks of any questions? Go ahead. So how do you get started with all, all of this? Um, six months ago, I'd have said you need to set up Active Directory. You need to configure ADFS. You need to configure some users on that. You need to add certificates. And then you need to set up some LDAP transform rules. But you don't have to do any of that because we have a Docker container in GDK. And so I'll, I'll run you through how to configure it with that. So the main thing, or the first thing, sorry, is adding it to the actual config. So with Instant SAML, it would have looked something like this. So you're saying what the fingerprint um, for the certificate is. You're saying where you want the user, user to be redirected back to to process that SAML response, where you actually want the users to be sent to for the identity provider, and um, who we are. There's also this name ID identifier format, which is uh, less important, but we'll often want that to be persistent. But we'll leave it like that. But for gitlab.com SAML, it's just add the name group SAML. And then you configure it through the, the UI. The next thing is, is to run this simple SAML PHP service. So we'll do that with uh, Docker. And I've forked, someone had a, a Docker image all set up and ready to go. And so we've made a fork of that with some minor changes that aren't too important. Um, and we configure it like this. But um, first we'll go in and we'll create a group. And I'll just sign in as root to do that. Um, in, in reality, you wouldn't sign in as group. Um, sorry. You wouldn't sign in as root. You'd sign in as a, a user on the organization. So we'll just create a group and we'll call that uh, my demo group. And so when we're configuring the identity provider, we'll need those bits of information. Sorry, that path. And I will just stop the one I was running before because um, I'm going to reuse the same port. But in theory, you could have lots of these running. So that we're configuring the two things, same as before, where we want to be sent back. So that's sometimes called the assertion consumer service URL, which is a mouthful, sometimes called the callback URL. And we're configuring the issuer, which here is called the entity ID. So there can be a lot of confusion, confusing terminology, like sometimes assertions are called claims. Um, it all starts to blend, blend in and make sense eventually. So next we'll go in and we'll configure SAML for this group. And going back to the 
um, the GDK docs, it tells us the certificate fingerprint for that Docker container and the URL we need to use. So I'll fill that in here. So we've got the certificate fingerprint and the URL. And here we also we provide the information that we used when configuring the, the Docker container, but our users will often be configuring that on Azure or on ADFS or um, on a, any of a number of services. Now, one of the differences I mentioned with GroupSaml is users don't sign in from the kind of global gitlab.com page. They sign in on a, on a different page for each group. So we go to this one and we've got a, a warning saying, you're about to, to link this account and it will grant you access um, so it can sign you into GitLab. So the user will click authorize and be redirected to simple SAML. And I'll, I'll just use user one again. And this document container only has user one and user two. So, oh, what have I done? Thing is, I demoed this earlier and it worked. No route. Is GTK actually working? I've seen this error when like my uh, my uh, web worker wasn't quite working right. See, so, yeah, I'll I'll just restart that. But one thing that I do that not everyone does is I run a worker in a separate process to the rest of GDK, and that means if I'm debugging, I can jump jump straight in there. Um, I know what I've done there. This isn't a problem with GDK. This is the way I've configured the Docker container. I've I've put its callback URL to my org, my demo group, but it should actually be groups, my demo group, SAML callback. So we'll go ahead and we'll Um, so we'll stop and so down. So here it should have been callback, and here it should have been my demo group. So it's it, it does show that this is the URL that the identity provider will send users back to. Um, and so, yeah, configuration mistake. So let me just go back to the SSO page and double check that yep, we're listening on the right socket again. And so user one, user one pass. If I were to inspect this with the SAML panel, we'd see very similar activity to with the instant SAML. Um, I think I've clicked a bit late. Cool. And so we're, it's saying we've now connected it to our account. So the user does not need an account before that, or do they have to have an existing GitLab account. So, um, so the allowing this on GitLab.com with sign-in is a work in progress merge request. So I'll just describe how it is at the moment. But um, if 
if when you visit that page, you don't have an account, it will redirect you to the identity provider because it doesn't know if you have an account yet. They'll redirect back, will show the registration page and if, um, or the sign in or registration page, if someone signs in, then it will redirect them back and they'll be, their account will be linked for the first time. And if they register, when they do that, it'll, it'll be linked. So we, we don't have a automatic registration process, but because of the way we're doing the redirects, they'll get shown the sign in or sign or register page if they haven't uh, linked an account before. Um, but one of the things we'll, we're looking to add in the future is something called SCIM. And so that allows organizations to add and remove users automatically um, so that they don't need to worry about this as much. And the, just to include a link to the tool that um, I was using, and there's also SAML Tracer for Firefox. Um, any, any questions? Again. Cool. So now I'm going to go through just some areas of the code um, so that if you're reviewing a merge request or trying to look for security flaws, um, you have a, a vague idea of where to look for things. Um, th there's quite a lot to go through, so I'm just going to start ju jumping into the code and kind of showing you different areas. So feel free to jump in with any questions. Um, so we'll start with the identity model. So this is used by um, LDAP and OAuth sign-in. But one thing we do differently with group SAML is we also store which SAML provider um, has been used. So w when we're looking up who, who's, who someone is, we can say they've signed in with this SAML provider and they've got this UID, I'm sorry, this extern UID, which is the name ID. And so with that combination of, we know who it is from the name ID and we know which identity provider saying, that, saying who that is, we can identify the user to look up. Um, the, the SAML provider itself is just those things we configured in the in the user interface. So that's the certificate fingerprint with a link to the group. And um, through those identities, it lets us find all the users for that SAML provider. And you can see that um, we've got this name ID format that would have been configured in, in the configuration. Here that's configured in the SAML pro provider. So w one of the, the key things about how this works within our code base is that we use OmniAuth. And so um, that comes in before we kind of hit the Rails stack. We, um, OmniAuth does its stuff in, in Rack Middleware and it has its own kind of way of doing things. So it has a setup phase and a re request phase. So that's where we create that auth request we saw earlier. And then it has a callback phase. The thing we do differently for uh, group SAML is we, in that setup phase, we look up which SAML provider this is, do some verifications on that, and then use the appropriate configuration for that provider. For um, instant SAML, um, we just use the Omni of SAML library as it is. So just to be clear, it looks like the group SAML stuff is only an EE, right? Yeah. So so with um. Uh, so with C, it just uses the uh, plain library itself. Um, and just to give you. A, like when I'm developing this, a lot of the time I do have to come in to, to the actual library um, and, and have a look at what's happening here. Um, and that, that's all configured here. So we've got the request phase. Um, it uses the configured settings. It does a bunch of stuff with um, the fingerprint. Um, and it also calls through to Ruby SAML, um, which is a library 
um, that does the kind of low, lower level validations and things like that. Um, in, in both cases, the user then comes after, after it's been validated that that's a valid response with a correct fingerprint um, and, and everything's correct about it. Only then do we get through to, to the rail stack and to the, the callback controller. Um, and we, we kind of have, so it's, we kind of have two different paths that can be taken here. One's when the user's already signed in and one's when they're not signed in. And so it's, it's a bit weird because we do two different things and that everything's in two different places. But the, the kind of key thing to um, wrap your head around is that we have an identity linker and, and in here we say if the user's signed in, then we either um, link, their, link their account if it's the first time or if it's already linked, then we do, do that check in here as well. And this is the and this code here is actually shared across um, different OAuth things across LDAP, um, and so it's something that we override specifically for groups and all there. Um, if the user is not signed in, then there's this whole other bit of code, um, but it also handles things like logging audit events. Um, setting remember me tokens, dealing with two-factor authentication. And by having that shared with the other ways users can log in, it means we don't end up accidentally forgetting to do two-factor authentication with SAML or anything like that. Um, the auth user classes are where that's then handled. And so we have one for SAML and one for group SAML. Um, <laughs> I'm on a branch where I don't have that implemented, but it's very, it, does very simple stuff, looks up the user um, and just returns if they're signed in or not. So as you can see there. So that's a very high level run through. Um, those are the key, key, key things to look for. Cool. Security. Um, it's in the name. It's the security assertion markup language, which means that there's a whole lot of things that could go wrong. Um, the, the main kind of ways that SAML uh, helps protect us is it's got this, this protocol that's very well thought out, very well specified, and then it's signed with, um, with that certificate. And so you've got XML signing, and you've got all these validations that different parts of that XML are correct and as we expect it. But that also means that those are all the places where it can go wrong. So attackers can bypass the XML signing. Sometimes they'll do this by creating a second element with the same name. Um, and depending on how you pass the XML, you might get the one that's actually valid or the one that they've inserted. There was an attack where they use XML comments to change a user's ID. So instead of being user ID um, one, they can make it user ID one, XML comment thousand, and then using that, you can have it so that when you look at the XML one way, you use a one, and when you look at it another way, you use a one thousand. And by doing that, they can choose which user that they they want to be. And so there's there's all sorts of very clever attacks based around this. And so um, yeah, um, I'll I've got a slide here showing all the different validations that Ruby SAML does. Um, and so you, so you can see it, it validates the response state, it validates the signature, it validates that the issuer is the correct thing because if, if it wasn't GitLab but Office that had sent that SAML request, then it would be completely invalid. It, valid, it validates the time on the, the response. So when we um, get back a response, it only has a short window in which it's valid and that prevents replay attacks. But then it has another time that says this user is definitely this user for this many years or months or weeks. And so they can, um, so the identity provider can make these assertions with different time periods as well. Um, yeah, every single one of these is, is something that an attacker can work around. Um, so we have to be careful thinking about those. Luckily, Ruby Samuel takes a lot of that 
away and does it all for us, but there's a lot of things we also need to be care careful of. Um, and I'll just jump to this slide for a bit. One of the complications with this multi-tenant SAML is that the identity provider might not be um, trustworthy. So when we're configuring in the config our own identity provider, we know it's trustworthy, but when we allow any user on gitlab.com to add their own identity provider, they could then trick users into um, visiting um, some, some site where randomly on the internet being redirected to their malicious identity provider, um, which, which will, could then send back a valid response all by itself. And then, hey, they can, they can, that identity provider can now sign its own users into GitLab. So they can then go on their computer, and pretend to be you and hijack your account. So that there's, it, it, so although we haven't changed much, we've, we have to be extra careful um, and we also need to protect against social engineering because we've got that, that warning page saying, are you sure you want to link this account? But if someone doesn't know what that means, they might give permission um, to someone else to sign them in. Um, and some of those attacks I've been talking about, they've allowed um, uncontrolled access to Office 365 and to GitHub. So they're not just theoretical attacks, they're, they're ones that people have actually gone out and found ways to, um, it, for research purposes, enact. But um, yeah, so we need to make sure we're very thorough with re when reviewing this and, and think about all, all these different possible scenarios. Questions? James, is there, is there anything we can do to kind of approve or like pre-check the identity provider? I guess not, because it could potentially be self-hosted and something that we're completely unaware of up front. Yeah, so it, it's something we, we could place an organizational process around this and saying whenever someone enables SAML, um, we'll, we'll check their identity provider. Um, but an, another kind of attack that made me kind of not like that as much is that someone might set up a, a cert, an identity provider just to play around with, with things. And then that might have a vulnerability that can then be, if someone can get access to any one of these valid organizations, they can start attacking users as well. So it, it still wouldn't completely protect us. Um, and it would add a lot of process overhead. So it's not, not perfect. Um, how, how, so uh, just to back up here a little bit, uh, so, you know, with LDAP group sync, basically you've got groups in your LDAP provider and then as soon as you log in, they, we automatically sync users that belong to the group. Is the same thing happening with, with, uh, SAML here? So it's something we'll, we'll plan to do, but at the moment they configure the identity provider for the top level group. Um, and we don't do any, anything other than adding the users to the group. But because we've got those assertions and they can say this, this user's in group X, we've got plans to then use that and say, they've asserted they're in group X, let's add them to group X. Um, but that, that's something we need a bit of design around and also um, which permission level they have, because at the moment they'll be added as guest, but we might want to, we might, we we'll want to allow them to add people directly as developer um, or maintainer. Okay, so in the user flow right now, so let's say this gets deployed to gitlab.com, you know, next week or whatnot. Um, people set up there, they have a group, a GitLab group, they set up their own SAML provider, right? And what does that give them now? That gives them the ability to just uh, people to log in and, and, and get access to that group or we they still have to manually add users to that group? So, so what we've already got on gitlab.com is, is that ability that when someone signs in with SAML, it automatically adds them to the group. So if I sign into that my org um, SAML provider, I automatically get added to that top level group. What, what we don't have on gitlab.com yet is the bit that actually signs you into gitlab.com. So they need to enter their username and password first. So it's it's kind of halfway there. Ah, got it. So it syncs the, the, the existing group, but it doesn't automatically log them in. Yep. Got it, okay. Yep. 
and um, that kind of leads us on to the, the things that we want to do next. Uh, that there are also things that we're going to need security review on, things that we're going to need UX review on, and things that I'd like to be able to assign to maintainers rather than having to say, I don't know what this is, I I'm not, not too sure. So um, th these are all things that are relevant. So as I mentioned, um, sign the, act the actual sign-in bit is something that's um, work in progress merge request. And as, as part of that, there are these kind of th th three other merge requests allowing users to unlink their accounts um, and providing that warning up front. Um, there's also this metadata configuration because one of the things that SAML administrators like to do is just get a, a URL for some XML that auto configures everything for them. And the next stage is providing administrators with more power over enforcement because they, they want to be able to say all the users on this group all use SAML so that no one could be added um, or accidentally get um, added. Um, that's just a normal gitlab.com user. A another thing that we, we see people wanting is the ability to say that that user is currently signed in with SAML. They haven't signed in with their gitlab.com username and password. And so that um, lets them for audit reasons say, yes, they've definitely used all our policies. They've used two-factor authentication and we haven't removed them from our system because they're signing in with the right provide with SAML. And then um, two other things are making those memberships expire if someone doesn't hasn't signed in recently and then allowing them to mass add users and remove users when they leave the company um, and, and to do that we can't really use SAML because it's a browser-based protocol so if someone's left the company they can't exactly um, log in and go through the flow and be trusted to do that so we need to look at another technology SCIM and then uh, kind of net next area for improvement is the stuff we were talking about with setting the access level. So whether they're guest, report, main, uh, maintainer, and um, deciding which subgroups to add the user to. And also making sure that those notifications go to the email address they are pri provided in that assertion rather than just their um, personal email address. Um, finally, just some um, of the, the area we want to work on after that is making things easier for the user. Um, so things like si sign out, a better registration flow, um, and just items which are polished in the UI. So things like displaying the active sessions on the user profile correctly. So um, recap, um, SAML, it's great for organizations, managing users, great for individuals, um, only having to click one thing to sign in. Group SAML is the thing I've been working on um, and we've got a, a lot more to go, but it's, it's going to be very powerful for organizations which want to move to gitlab.com instead of self-hosting. And so it's something that for sales is really important and something that's really, really important for a lot of organizations. Um, and so it's, a, yeah, just some, some resources that I've linked to. You've got the full SAML specifications in all their detailed glory, um, some links to the doc, and you can reach out if you have any questions after in gmanage on Slack or myself or Jeremy Watson's the PM for this. Any final questions? So I'm just curious in terms of like people, why would someone choose using a SAML provider over like an LDAP provider? So they're, they're kind of a different beast in some ways. So for GitLab.com, one of the reasons not to look at LDAP is it sends passwords over the internet. So someone using LDAP, they, they put their password into the, the UI and we, we don't really want uh, organizations giving having their users g give us their password each time and sending that over the internet to their server. And um, it's a very different approach. For um, self-hosted things, when they're, they're, it's all within a contained network, sometimes it's just the, the convenience for the users. It's, it's one click. If they're already signed in to their office account or um, the 
their gyro account or anything else it's just one click and they don't even need to notice it they don't need to put in a password each time um, but yeah it solves a very similar problem to wildapp Um, if you have any any other questions that you think of straight after we're finished, just as I said, ping on gmanage. Cool. Thanks, Thanks a lot, James. Really helpful. Thank you. That was awesome, James. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, James. No worries. See ya.